a powerful song. Christmas season is upon us and we're getting ready to, to celebrate Christmas and we are starting a series uh, just called Advent. And I don't know about you, but I just want to make a confession here today. I've been in ministry for 20 years, been a Christian for 25, and I have no idea what Advent is. Like, I, I, that sounds probably terrible, but like I've asked people over the years, like, what, what is Advent? And and it's not really in the Bible or anything, so I was just like, I don't, I don't know what that really is. And then we were like, oh, we're going to call the series this, so i got to figure it out. So I went to Google, and somebody explained it to me using food, and now I get it. Here's what the internet told me. The internet told me that the reason we have fruitcake and Christmas pudding is because you mix those things up. We stir it up. And the reason we have those during Advent is because we are stirring up our hearts in preparation for Christmas. So that's what Advent is, if you didn't know. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. Somebody explained it using food, right? And you may sound that, say that, like, that sounds like dumb, but like, basically that's what communion is, right? Is explaining something really important with food. Let me uh, begin today. Um, I've... <laughs> That, uh, that line from that sign, uh, song sticks out today is, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. As we go through this series and we talk about Advent, each week we're going to talk about an important aspect and today we're going to focus in on hope. But this line comes across and it's like, hey, the thrill of hope. And when I think of like the new birth of Jesus, I wonder like, is that, is that the thrill of hope? Because we all need hope. But like when I think about Jesus being born, is that really that? My objective today would be to simply take your desire, your need for hope and connect it to why that is ultimately fulfilled and why your hope ultimately should be in Jesus. Because here's the thing, we all need hope. We're, we, we thrive on it. You've gone through some very difficult times in your life because you had hope. Without that desire or that move to put your hope in something, you would, you would die, you can go through incredibly difficult things if you know there's hope on the other side when you were in college and you just didn't think that you could write another paper. You had the hope that one day you'll graduate and get out of college. When you had an infant, some of you out there that have had the infant experience and you realized how awful that is, like what a bummer having an infant is and the staying up late and the sleepless nights, but then you had the hope that brought you through it that one day this thing is gonna do more than just suck the life out of you. You put your, you put your hope in something, right? You, you, we're always like going through difficult things. Some of you have had loss in your life. You've really had to mourn some incredible loss and it felt like a burden that you weren't able to carry on your own, but you had hope. You put your hope in something. And the object of what you put your hope in is one of the most important things about you. What you actually, because we're all going to do it. We're all going to put our hope in something. But the, but the thing that you put your hope in, that is the most important thing about you. It defines you. It, it sets the course of your actions. Like you are who you and what you put your hope in. But here's the problem. We're terrible at putting our hope in the right things. We have a tendency to put our hope in things that are finite, that are, that are close, that are, that are simple, that are sometimes even superficial, and we think, man, that's gonna fix everything. If we, if we just had that relationship, if we just had enough money, a lot of times one of the things we put our hope in is we put our hope in the future that things are gonna get better. Right? That's, that's where our hope a lot of time goes, is, is just this one line, this too shall pass. And we go, hey, things are going to get better. And so we put our hope that things are going to get better. And that's why you end up with old people who are old and cynical, because eventually they found out what? Things don't really get better. <laughs> it's just a different kind of suck. That's what life <laughs> is. I'm here to bring hope. I don't know... I don't know if I was clear about that. 
But we have a tendency to put our hope in all of the wrong things. And today, I wanna connect to that desire you have, that, that need you have for putting your hope in something and why it's actually found in, in Jesus. To do that, I wanna identify with a, a, a character in the scripture, one of the people that was on the earth when Jesus was born, and his name was Simeon. Here's what we know about Simeon in Luke chapter two. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. In other words, he was waiting, I'll explain this in a minute, he was waiting for, for God to do what God had promised for a very long time in Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Simeon represents all of the nation of Israel and really he represents all of the world. He is in a place where he is waiting for, some, for God to do something. Now a brief history on Israel. God had given his commands to his people and he said, hey, here's the relationship. You do what I command you to do, you're obedient and I will bless you and everything will go fantastic and great for you. And I could sum up all of the Old Testament by just saying this, and then they didn't. That's the entire, if you want just the, the cliff notes of the Old Testament, God said, do all of these things, I will bless you, and then they didn't. And if I could, I'd just like to insert you into this story. I think we can connect with the nation of Israel. Isn't that all of us? Didn't all of us grow up? Maybe if you grew up with faith, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like do what God wants me to do. I'm gonna be obedient. I'm gonna be faithful. I'm gonna follow after God. And then you, and then you didn't, or maybe you couldn't. Or maybe if you weren't raised in church, you, you were raised with the idea that you need to become a good person. And you discovered that being a good person was actually difficult and you weren't capable of being that good person. The nation of Israel represents all of humanity because they're in a place where they just couldn't. And because of that, because of that about six centuries before Jesus, they, God said it, it, it's over and he put them into captivity and they were, they were put in captivity by the Babylonians. And then the Babylonians became the Persians and the Persians became the Greeks and the Greeks became the Romans. And when we come into this place, the nation of Israel, God's chosen and holy people on earth, his light to the world is under captivity and there's this heavy burden because it is, it is because of their disobedience, it's because of their sin, it's because they're far from God and so now they're living this way. And so now their only hope, when you talk about their hope, is the Messiah that God will send a person who's going to deliver them, who's going to free them. But let's, let's connect with Israel just a little bit before we move on. But they are looking for hope in the wrong places. And this is what you and I do. What they think is the Messiah is gonna come and come back and make all of their wildest dreams come true and this Messiah is gonna come back and he's gonna be like, he's gonna be like a king, he's gonna be strong, he's gonna be like a Jewish Dwayne the Rock Johnson and he's gonna come back. He's gonna be a warrior and he's gonna lead them to victory. He's gonna overthrow the Roman Empire and the nation of Israel once again be God's people. So that's where Simeon's at, that's where the nation of Israel's at, and really this is the place where the world is at. This is what happened next. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts where the parents brought in the child Jesus because he was just recently been born to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. In other words, I can die now because you have been faithful. Because from my eyes have seen your salvation. And I think the people that were holding the baby Jesus, the parents, as he took them in the arms and they said that, they must have looked and gone, really? I mean, really? This, this is the Messiah? This is the salvation? Maybe Simeon was crazy after all. Maybe that's what they concluded. And then he goes one step farther. And he says, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, 
a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Not just talking about the deliverance of the nation of Israel, he's talking about the deliverance of the light to all people. The Gentile is just anybody that's not a Jew. Simeon's kind of stepping out on his own here and he's saying something that they don't even understand. He's saying, it's not just gonna be for God's people, it's going to be for every person on the planet. This child will be a light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Now, I think what's important for us to note at this point is that, again, people looked at that and just went, okay, I don't necessarily see that. You might be in a place where you look and you're like, man, I need hope, right? I got things going on in my life. There's difficulties that I'm facing. I I got challenges. I need hope. And I come to church and I try to put my hope in Jesus because we're looking for Jesus to kind of step into our frustration and our immediate moment. And he's supposed to give us life and prosperity and blessing and purpose and meaning. And he's supposed to heal my anxiety and my depression. And he's supposed to cure sort of what's going on in my life. And and so that's why people people come to church. That's why we celebrate Christmas is because we're looking for hope. And just like God did for the nation of Israel and for all of the world, God gives us a hope that is far greater than what we're actually looking for. He gives us the light of the world found in Jesus Christ. Now, In order to understand what it means that Jesus is the light of the world, the light to Gentiles and the light to the entire world, the only way to really understand the light is to to understand the darkness. I'm gonna get a little depressing today, okay? Because before we, before we talk about what it means that Jesus is the light of the world, I, I think it's important that we understand what is he illuminating? I really feel like this happens, that a lot of times on Christmas Eve, we invite our friends and family, we have a candle lighting service, and it's a really cool thing, or we get up and talk about Jesus as the hope of the world. I think we just say that, and people are like, okay, but unless they understand what he's lighting, what's actually broken, what's actually dark in the world, it means nothing. Nothing. So today, I want to take a moment, I want to take some time, I want to get a little depressing here, and I just, I just want to talk about what the darkness is that Christ is actually illuminating. The first thing is just, just simply this, people cause hurt intentionally. Since the beginning of time, that has been the number one standard, people intentionally, they know they're going to create hurt, and they go ahead and they hurt other people intentionally. 21,000 people last year in the United States of America decided it would be a good idea to kill another human being. Maybe it was because of rage, maybe it was out of anger, maybe it's just because they wanted their stuff. 21,000 people killed another human being. In the United States, there are 747,000 registered sex offenders, three quarters of a million. And the problem with that, I mean, the darkest part about that statistic is they say that only about one in 10 of every every, uh, sexual misconduct, about one in 10 are actually convicted. And so there's a lot of people going around there who have experienced that and people that have done that who haven't even been caught. We have to have police officers to make sure that people don't take our stuff We have to have malware on our computers because there are people out there working day and night to try to figure out how to send you a fake Facebook request so that they can request money from all of your friends. We have people that are actively out there trying to hurt other people. But that's just the illegal stuff. I could go on and on about all the things in this world that are illegal and that we literally have to have the threat of death or punishment to keep people from doing things to hurt other people. But probably the biggest hurt in your life is something that somebody caused you that wasn't even illegal. They cheated on you. You were trusting in somebody and they betrayed you. They, they were supposed to be there for you, but they let you down. They were just downright mean. They knew what they were going to do to you and that it was gonna hurt you and they did it intentionally. That is the world we live in and we sometimes think of that as just normal. 
It's just like, yeah, that's just life. There's awful people out there trying to do awful things, and that is somehow normal to us. That is just life. On top of that, then you have people who cause hurt unintentionally. Uh, There was not even a thing uh, years ago was PTSDs, but now that is a regular thing that we actually diagnose, that we're able to actually see that when people experience trauma, devastating trauma because of uh, things happening in life, they are actually uh, in a place where they, they didn't know it, they didn't step into that, they didn't walk into it, but now they are unintentionally experienced. It's an unintentional result. There's many times where people are out there and they're just having a good time, right? I'm just, maybe you were that guy in college, you were just hooking up. You were just hooking up with different people and it, it, it didn't seem like you were hurting anybody. In fact, it actually kind of felt like the opposite. It felt like maybe a, a compliment or kind of an intimate moment. You didn't realize till later that you were actually creating harm in yourself and you were creating harm in the people around you. In fact, have you ever done this? Have you ever gotten to a point in your life where you look back and you realize, oh, I didn't realize the damage I was causing in other people's life. Here's what the old people tell me, not me, I'm not old, but the old people tell me, (laughs) what I've noticed anyway, is the older you get, the more regrets you have because, because you realize there were things you didn't even know that you were doing that were creating damage in people's lives. And all of us are out there and we're, we're just trying to avoid the intentional stuff, the things that we already know are wrong, but there's all kinds of things out there that we are doing unintentionally. Hurt people retaliate by causing hurt and other, other ways to say this is hurt people hurt people. It's widely known that there's a connection between abuse. This doesn't mean this has to happen, but if you're abused as a child, it is more likely or you're more susceptible to cause that same abuse. You see this over and over again in the world, like people that just, we we wake up, we grow up in this world and everything's kind of fine and then we, people hurt us and we end up being scarred and wounded by that and we retaliate against other people with the same kind of hurt. Hurt caused by collective ignorance. I could go on about this, but this is a huge thing. If you study history, if you look back over time, you'll look back into different time and periods in life and be like, how did you guys think that was okay? Like it's okay for us to now look back and go, yeah, slavery was bad, duh. Didn't you get that? Owning people's bad. But nobody seemed to get it back then. Everybody seemed to be like, this is just the way life is. And when everybody around you is engaged in something and they don't call it immoral, then it's hard for you to even see it as wrong. And I can promise you when people look back hundreds of years from now and they look back at us, there is something that they're gonna look at in our culture, in our time and go, man, I can't believe that they thought that was okay but we're looking around and we don't necessarily know what it is because we are ignorant and everybody else around us is telling us it's okay. And then the hurt I have inflicted on others. Here's what we spend most of our life dealing with, the the shame and the pain and the hurt that comes from the fact that we know that what, what we've done. We know that we've been the person to create that hurt, the one that has done something wrong. And here's what we do. We have a tendency to like really minimize that. We really minimize that and we like to focus on other people. Well, this is the people that are doing the things wrong and the hurt that they're causing and, and we like to minimize what we're doing because we don't like to deal with it. Our, our dissonance won't allow us to deal with the fact that we're just like everybody else. And so we don't deal with it. But as we look at these things, this is... What's wrong with the world? This is the darkness in the world. And what scripture calls that, or what the Bible calls that, is it calls the word hurt, is actually called sin. People cause sin intentional. People cause sin unintentionally. Hurt people retaliate by causing sin. Sin caused by collective ignorance. Sin I have inflicted on others. That's what's broken and wrong with the world, is that we are all this. And so God looks at us, at at the creation, at his humanity that he made, and he steps back. And and in Romans chapter 3, it tells us God's opinion 
of the world. It tells us God's perspective on what's broken, what's wrong with humanity. Romans chapter three goes like this. There is no one righteous. Not even one. This is God looking at humanity. He's looking at us and going, there's not one. There's no one who is righteous, no one who is good. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together, collectively, become worthless. There is no one who does good. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I told you, it's dark. And God looks at humanity. He sees the brokenness. He sees the hurt that we cause each other. He stands back and he realizes that we're all in the same boat and that leads to even more darkness It leads to separation from God. That God who is holy and righteous and perfect can't have a relationship with humanity because we are all so unrighteous, unholy, and we all produce the same kind of hurt and pain in the world. And God's reaction to that, here's where things get a little bit darker. God's reaction to that. Well, what would you do? What would you do if you were in God's situation and you saw humanity for what it really was? And imagine, you're not just evaluating people the way you evaluate people, but you can understand people's every thought and heart and motive and intention all the time. Like even the people that look like the good people, he knows what's going on inside of their mind. What would you do? I think think we would do the same thing God does, the, the same thing we do with our teenagers. I, I, I'm not throwing shade at teenagers, okay? I just want to put, I was one at one point and I was awful. Anybody else in here awful as a teenager? Yeah, it's just part of growing up, right? You're just an awful human being for four years. But anyway, you, uh, when, we were, when we were teenagers, we were this way and I have teenagers, I've worked four through my house now and I can tell you, during this time in their life where they're struggling for the first time with this, this brand new ego, this brand new sense of independence, this brand new sexual drive, these brand new desires that they have, and they're wrestling with their their sinful nature. The worst possible thing to do in that moment is to give them everything that they want, right? The best thing that I can do for them is not buy them the shoes that they want or get them the clothes they want or heaven for sake, buy them a car. Like that's like the last thing that they need. I want to be good to them, I want to care for them, I want to love them, but I do not want them to to be able to live without a curfew and, and go and do whatever they want and have complete freedom and independence all the time. What are people who have everything that they want when they're teenagers? They're spoiled brats, and it only leads to more problems. And so what we do is we have curfews, we have restrictions, we say no, we say no a lot over and over and over again. And that's what God does with humanity. God sees the brokenness in humanity. He sees that what we're capable of, what we do in, in any given scenario. And he decides to curse the world. The darkness gets worse. And the reason we have earthquakes and tornadoes, the reason there's cancer and death, the reason that there's so much heartbreak and sorrow isn't because God wants that. God doesn't want that. But the reason that God allows that to happen is because it's what Thomas Aquinas calls the the best of all possible worlds. Instead of just giving us complete freedom and allowing us to be whatever we wanna be and do whatever we wanna do, he actually curses the world and he says, no, you need humility, you need to find your way back to me, you need to not have everything that you want, which of course results in pain, loss, and sorrow. What are you gonna put your hope in that fixes that? Are you gonna put your hope in a relationship? 
Oh man, if I just had the right person to be with, that would solve all of my problems. No, it doesn't, it doesn't solve that. So why do we put our hope in people? You're gonna put your hope in, in money? Oh, if I just had enough money. If I could just pay all my bills and have a little excess and maybe go on vacations and have that clothes that I want, if I could just have the life that I want, then, then everything would be great. Is that gonna fix that? Anybody know any rich people that still struggle in life? So why do we put our hope in money? Oh, well, if I could just find my, if I could find my purpose in life, if I could have this sense of fulfillment that I'm doing something that actually is good and like, uh, you know, I can just get my ego strict in that way, then that would be enough. Do you really think that solves this problem? Does that give you what you're looking for? So why do we put our hope there? Listen, do you think that there is a political party or a government or a president that can solve this problem? but only make it worse? So why, with everything that we have, do we continue to put our hope there? It can't help what's broken with humanity. Only, only God himself coming to earth in the form of Jesus Christ through the redemptive work on the cross, washing us and making us pure, giving us real genuine hope that he might change us, change an individual from the inside out by the washing of his blood so that he can make us new creations in Christ. That is the only thing worth putting your hope in and everything else is a false hope. And today, when Simeon is holding the baby in his arms and he goes, I've seen the salvation from God. I've seen the light of the world. And everybody looked at him and said, are you sure, Simeon? There are many people this Christmas season that are gonna look at Jesus and go, I don't know that that, I don't know that that fixes my problems. That doesn't give me the hope I'm looking for. And I'm trying to tell you that God is giving you a hope that is far beyond what you even desire. To the point in 1 Peter, 1 Peter writes this, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and then into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Jesus introduces an ultimate solution that none, none of the organizations, none of the people, none of the plans or the processes in this world can even begin to offer hope. He comes in to offer us hope into an eternity where our relationship with him is ultimately restored, where sin is no more, and what's actually broken with the world, what's actually broken with us, it disappears and goes away. Man, if you, if you want real, lasting hope, look beyond the things you normally put your hope in. In fact, look beyond this. Look beyond this hope that you normally put to God because a lot of times we just treat God like he's a, a genie in a bottle. And it's like, God, could you like, could, yeah, okay, this is great. You're all powerful and stuff. Uh, give my life to Jesus, that's good. Can you fix this and can you fix this and can you fix this? And God's like, I want to, I wanna redeem God's relationship with mankind. I want to restore you. I want to make you something new. Would you give me your entire heart? When the angels appeared to the shepherds, they said, but the angels said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. There's an opportunity for you to put your faith in the only thing that actually brings hope. Today, if you haven't ever made that decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, make that decision, not, not a decision 
to, to, to have faith so that God can fix your problems. Make a decision to yield and surrender your life completely to him and look to him because he's the only one that actually knows what's broken with the world and he's the only one that offers hope. Let me pray for you today. Father God, I pray. I pray that as we, as we get ready to look into this season, as we begin to wrap our minds around what it means that a, the divine, all-powerful God became a human, became like one of us. God, I pray that you would help us to put our hope in something that truly matters. God, help us to break through the darkness. Help us to rise above the rest of the world and to see the hope that you genuinely offer to us. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen. Right now we're gonna move